Ladies and gents, the next session is called Quarterbacks and Acrobats, and it will be a unique look at the diverse worlds of football and circus to see how head coaches work to take their prospective talents to the world's very best. Matthew Sparks is the first speaker. He's the head coach and dance captain of the world-famous Cirque du Soleil in Las Vegas, who perform for over 500 times a year. He also has expertise in working in music and gymnastics, which means he has a very diverse skill set and perfect for this session. Mark Helfrich is the, alongside him and he's the head coach of the Oregon Ducks football and as well as this, specialised in the past in the development of quarterbacks. So he'll have a great experience of team development as well as indivi individual development. Steve Geary is also back for his second stint as moderator today and the session sponsors are Coach B Plus who are experts in transforming the management of, of athletic performance data to some of the best teams and the best leagues in the world. Um, Tio, the chief executive, is here so if you get a chance do uh, grab him and have a chat with him. So please welcome... Steve, Mark, and Matthew to the stage. All right, I think we do have a, uh, we have a short video here, um, so bear with us while we uh, put that on. Here we go. So obviously, uh, incredibly impressive. Uh, Cirque du Soleil is um, always that ecosystem of performers has always been really remarkable. Um, just for you, Coach, do you want me to try and run out of the building and so you we can don't tackle me really quick that. so Nothing we can demonstrate wrong. American football? I think he's the most flexible person here, and I'm definitely the stiffest person here. So yeah, <laughs> uh, just I'll do some stretches later, and I will definitely disprove that. Um, so we're going to dive right into it. Uh, culture. So we've started to talk about culture a little bit more as the day's gone on. So the job of coach has seemingly become one of chief culture creator. So uh, can both of you talk a little bit more about how you have tried to create a culture as a coach inside your organizations? And Matthew, let's start with you. I would say at Cirque du Soleil, one of our sort of unique systems is we have people from so many different countries. It said 55 countries around the world are represented inside of our shows. Mm -hmm. Every act is diver diverse, people from all different countries. So we have to find the common ground, and the common ground we try and drive for is, uh, is basically a sense of ownership. We want all of the artists to feel a sense of ownership of what they're doing on stage, a sense of ownership in the show, the act that they're part of, uh, to understand most of these people are hired, maybe they're a, a trapeze flyer, and they come from traditional circus where the trapeze is what they do. They perform on trapeze, and, and that's their whole buy-in. Once they arrive at Cirque, they do so much more in the show. They dance, they act, they uh, have to learn to put on makeup. There, there's a whole investment in what it means to be a Cirque du Soleil artist and put a show on. So we need them to have a sense of ownership of the whole product, not just of the fact that I'm going to do a triple back flip tonight. It's it's owning and the pride of performance. How about you, Coach? You, you, you said something the other day about jumping all in. Well, definitely. I think I thought uh, Dave Wool did. Uh, was, we had a lot of similar kind of uh, aims in, in what we try to do, but definitely taking ownership is one of them. Getting a bunch of people around you that that you trust uh, with high level of, of competency, whether that's a, as a coach, competency and, and ability to, to to do your job and all the the uh, bullet points below your your you know your job title as a player, being very talented, um, and then just committed to each other. And I think. 
Uh, I thought the guys this morning, Tom and, and Les, their definition of having the boulders and kind of everybody manage their, their, their boulder and, and, and you have to trust that that's getting taken care of. And, and we certainly uh, invite our players. Our players are a big part of everything that we do, every decision we make, um, whether it's from the, the analytics and the metrics and getting them involved in, in why we do things and, and how it helps them 50, 60 years from now is, is vital. But just, again, the people, getting the, getting the right people in, in all those spots. So getting the right people. So p part of that is your coaching staff. So coaching your coaching staff, you know, how do you kind of prepare for that and, and how do you coach your coaches? Well, again, hopefully you're, you're, you're aligned. I think, again, Dave's word is, is excellent of, of you know exactly what you're going to do and theoretically exactly how you're going to do it. And then you go out and implement those things. But there's, there's people involved and they're going to make mistakes. Um, but we, we have guys that, again, are highly of high integrity, uh, very good at what they do, and care about our players. Our players are, are everything. I think, you know, for, uh, we're, trying to, we're trying to influence their behavior for their gain. Uh, you know, allow, like if I'm a business person, I'm, I'm trying to, to influence the, the behavior of the customer. We're trying to influence the behavior of the person that's going to gain the most from our product, so to speak. But getting, getting people that are like-minded in, in purpose, but a little bit, uh, and I, you know, say, that, that, that will they'll be convicted to, to, to exactly what their beliefs have been in the past and, and um, can speak up to maybe do things slightly differently, but again, all, all within our, our, our guidelines. Yeah, absolutely. And so, Matthew, your coaching staff, you, know, you, yeah. you have a lot of specialization. There's also a lot of specialization in you know, football as well. Um, so how do you manage your coaching staff? Our coaching staff, we, we actually start at the artist levels. We have uh, artists as part of succession planning as well. Yeah. We have artists that form inside the show, and they start to receive a little bit more responsibility. We'll identify somebody who has sort of leadership potential, and we'll identify them as a captain of a specific number. Eventually, they can move up and become an artist coach. They're still performing in the show. They're still an artist in the show, but now they're taking more of a, a coaching role and assisting the coach. We also have a show coach and a head coach. So we sort of have different levels, and people can progress through these levels. And uh, as they're going through them, we try and support them. We offer them you know, their initial management experience, start giving them some computer skills for documentation. Um, I ask them to be really open-minded. I like that expression that, uh, the mind is like a parachute, uh, it doesn't work if it's not open. And I sort of try and get my people to be really open-minded because many of them come from a background where they're very competent as a performer. They're, very, they're unbelievable acrobats. But we all know that it's a different skill to be uh, a learner and a teacher. And so trying to get those people to realize there's a whole bunch of stuff that I don't know. And I might need to teach something other than this one discipline that I'm an expert in. Because eventually in Cirque, once you're a, a head coach, you're not, if you started as a trapeze flyer, once you're a head coach, you're coaching everything. So you really have to have this broad, open mind and start a willingness to challenge yourself, to ask why, to let other people ask you why, and have, have answers and sort of grow and grow. So we try and nurture that from within the company. And, and help people grow a little bit. We're even trying to formalize the system a little bit more now than we have in the past. So as far as like kind of formalizing your player-coach relationship, you, you had something interesting that you talked about the other day with your squads. Could you just mm -hmm. tell the audience a little bit more about that? Yeah, it's basically a militaristic organization of, of, of squads within a squad. And so I, I would say, again, akin to being, having marketing and logistics and whatever else people have in, the, in their business. And it, it creates uh, ownership and, and, and forces people to interact with with, with different position groups. Uh, each coach is, is responsible for people that aren't necessarily at his, at, at, in their position or maybe even on their, on their side of the ball. We're in uh, not the most uh, football talent rich state in the country, so we have people from all over the country, not, not, not one tenth as diverse as you, but uh, people from North Carolina, New Jersey, all over the country that come to, to Eugene, Oregon and, and, and want to thrive. And so they're, they're very like-minded, but they're also a little scared that, you know, that, that for them to know that that's okay from a, a, a senior defensive lineman and they're a true freshman running back uh, is always uh, you know, good to hear and then it makes everybody kind of just reinforce the culture from, from a, a different spot. Interesting. So he brings up something interesting there that we talked about the other day, fear versus confidence. Mm. Can you just talk a little bit more about how you... Uh... It, it actually reflects a little bit also on my coaching yeah. philosophy. Uh, all star athletes, and I think it was regardless of sport, regardless of level, it can be a kid who's competing in a little league game versus, versus the highest level elite athlete in the world. Successful performers all have one thing in common, and that's confidence. And the biggest thing that blocks 
an athlete's path through success is fear. It can be fear of many different things. So I have the viewpoint that one of a coach's main jobs is to help increase a person's confidence and eliminate fear. And once, once you do that, then you're putting people on the path towards success. Interesting, yeah. So 1,000 mistakes. You mentioned that the other day. Yeah. So it's, 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 I think that's right in line with what he's talking about. Definitely, and I could never be, at, I'm not good enough to be at Pixar, but it's very, very analogous to, to Meg's discussion earlier. Is we, one thing that I do in our first team meeting is, is we say the first 1,000 mistakes are on, on me. And hopefully, hopefully there, we always say if, you're, you know, if you make a thousand different mistakes, you're going to be really good. Um, but just to, again, reinforce that, that, again, everybody's scared or apprehensive or whatever, whatever those uh, uh, descriptors are, uh, to go out and just fully cut it loose and, and optimize their talent and, and therefore thereby the teams, they have to, they have to know that that's okay. Uh, and, and they'll never, ever, ever reach their potential individually or us collectively. I don't, I don't think, in, in, you know, without that, that being, being off the table. Uh, now, nobody does that, right? By and large, there's still the, the, the just the, the, not the total buy-in to that, to that whole, whole mentality, but it has to start from, from being just out there, that that's okay to, to quote, unquote, fail. Um, you know, one, one less path to the, to the goal they, they can eliminate and, and make it more efficient from there. Absolutely. There's, there's so many things that can... That can uh, affect confidence and fear. And I mean, you can be afraid of so many different things. I have performers and they can be afraid to go on stage. I get people directly from sport and I'm trying to put them on stage. And if they are nervous, that's gonna affect their quality of performance. Uh, it can have to do with their physical preparation. If they, are, uh, if they feel they're not adequately physically prepared to do the job, then they're afraid of the results. Uh, and then there's also that just fear of confidence. If I think of it in, in, uh, in my context, I have people that, uh, you know, they're afraid of doing more and more difficult skills and they have a certain envelope that they're like, I can do all of this. I'm not worried about all of this. But once they get outside of that sphere of confidence, that's where the problem is. So we have to sort of progressively uh, convince them to expand that sphere by, by finding things like, uh, uh, if, if there's a problem, I'm going to speak very specifically about the problem. Right, they're afraid of something. So uh, if it's a, a twisting issue and I have them doing a, a, a simple element that's a twist and that they're doing that really well, I can generalize and go, oh my God, this guy's a twister. You, what a twister you are. I speak very, you know, this is one twisting thing he's doing, but I call him a twister. I tell him, you are a twister. That is awesome. <laughs> then he's have a problem t with uh, a simple, a, a, an element that involves twisting. You don't have a problem with twisting. You're a great twister. On this element, you're not dropping your arm at the right time, so I'm very specific about the problem. So I'm trying to build their confidence on issues going, this is amazing what you do here. Oh, there's a problem? Let's be specific about that. This arm, let's tilt tw tw this, let's think about the details about that, how we're gonna fix that. I think that helps build that whole confidence Definitely. thing too. It's interesting, because I mean, does, is it, do you see that happen from freshman to senior? Where you're at some point, hopefully, right, of, of, and I know we're going to talk about this a little bit, but we always ask our guys to just dive into the process, much like, much like was, was spoken of earlier, is just dive into the ocean, jump into the process with both feet, and they're, they're, you know, they're in, they're all in as long as they start, or they're in as long as they play, you know, X number of plays, or they, they see that, you know, tangible benefit to it. But, uh, you know, that was one thing that we took from the, from the military as well, is if, if it's something positive, it's personal, and so it, it's not... It, it's Matt. That was that was a great twist, or whatever you know, whatever whatever the triple. What I, le I learned triple and quad, and I learned some other stuff. All right. <laughs> conversation, but, but uh, or uh, this was a Blue Angels deal of, of if it was positive, it's personal. If it's a negative, it's it's positional. The right guard needs to you know step to the right or step to the left, or the the, you know, the CFO needs to to realign this budget and hit Cliff. That was a great budget, you know, or, or whatever those things are. But just per personalizing the positive, and and again, I think is you know they know that that you know that you're on the same page as is their well-being a long time from now. That opens up that that whole trust uh, scenario. So trust, the trust is important, and then just to stay on the fear versus confidence, just for one one more tick. Um, how about someone who develops a fear? Is there any different? difference in coaching someone who develops a fear, whether it's because they're coming back from an injury, an ACL perhaps, or someone who tears a labrum and has some sort of issue. How do you deal with that? The, the problem is the same, but mm -hmm. my approach would, would also stay the same. It's that sphere of confidence. So you have to progressively push it out. If it's an ACL injury, I mean, we know how difficult that is to come back from, from the, to the highest possible level. But you have to then start with 
with basic agility, you, the prep and the agility, and you work your way through, and you just start trying to expand that sphere of confidence, because if they don't trust their body, then they're beat. So I think it's always about the sphere of confidence. A common thing that we get in acrobatic sport, and I, I don't know what percentage of, of my artists will deal with it, but we call it the twisties. It's actually mechanically easier to do a flip with a twist than it is a flip that doesn't twist. So once they accidentally start twisting, they can get to the point where they can't do a straight flip anymore. As soon as they try and flip, they twist. And then they freak out because now they crash out and they're scared. So that's, uh, at least once a year, I'm dealing with somebody who is, uh, it's a career ender for some people because they, they can't get past that, they're beat. So you have to go back from, to basics and find what they can do with what's within their sphere of confidence. There's some things that they're gonna be able to do that's okay. And then just progressively push that sphere out and hope that you're gonna get them through this. So, so both of you, you know, manage large organizations um, and you have your own personal coaching style. Um, and obviously trying to you know, press that coaching style down to the lowest, you know, to, to your other coaches is important. But just talk about your own personal coaching style um, you know, right now. Just, you know, how do you kind of envision yourself, in specifically like when you were working with the quarterbacks? Well, I think those are two very different things. I think uh, being a, a position coach or an, an offensive coordinator, you're in charge of half the ball and half the team, essentially, whereas as, as, as being in charge of everything, you're in charge of everything. I thought those guys made some great points earlier. You think about, or you're, you're confronted with things. The, the very first day I got the job, I was confronted about the paint color of a hallway down around the corner that I had never thought about that hallway nor its paint color ever. Um, but now you're in charge of that, and on, on some level that, that matters. Um, and so just, again, highly competent people around you. We have an unbelievable staff of people that, that are like-minded, uh, and, and that's the absolute key. Um, I think, uh, you know, again, somebody talked about this earlier, of, of when it doesn't fit, fix it. It's for the greater good, and everybody's going to be on board with that um, and, and try to, to build consensus as much as possible, but sometimes that's not, not possible either. And, and just as a, in, in general, we want to we wanna operate with our, our foot on the gas 100%. And that, that again comes from alignment, trust, all the, all the things that, that have been hit, hit many times today uh, and belief in what you're doing. And how would you define your coaching style? I have a vision that uh, many coaches fall into sort of two very broad categories. You have drill sergeants and gardeners, and I want to perceive myself as a gardener. My, my picture of the drill sergeant, he's, uh, he's going to tell, he's going to have an assumption first that the athlete doesn't know what they're doing. The athlete only knows what I'm going to tell them, and I'm going to completely steer this whole process. I tell them, they do it. That's sort of the, my vision of the drill sergeant approach. And that really works pretty well in the short term. I don't think you're ever gonna receive optimal results that way. People aren't gonna meet their full potential. But in the short term, you're gonna get something deliverable, you're gonna get it fast. And then the, uh, the gardener sort of aspires to the idea that this athlete one day is gonna pass me. He's gonna know more than I am, I want, that's the goal, I'm gonna help this person grow. And he's gonna uh, ask questions that asks that person to ask more of themselves. His approach isn't gonna be so much uh, I say it, you do it. It's going to be, are you happy with that one? You think you could have done that one better? Where was your arm on that one? You think it would have been better if your arm was there? Do you want to do another one? That's the gardener. He's asking the, the athlete to ask more of themselves, and, and that person is going to develop, hopefully, an athlete that's going to keep growing. They're not waiting to be told what to do. They are they're fostering this environment and fostering this person that's going to turn that into an and amazing And I'm athlete. sort of more thinking, don't talk unless you can improve on the silence. I think that there's something in there. Uh, when we yell all the time, and if you're hard all the time, I think a couple things stop happening. You start sounding like Charlie Brown's teacher to the athlete. You start sounding like wah, 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 and they don't hear anything else. And you're telling them what to do every moment, so they're not thinking. So if you do that all the time, I think you foster this, this person who isn't listening, or, so they're not, they're not hearing you, they're not listening and they're not thinking. And if you're not listening and you're not thinking, it doesn't leave a lot that's gonna really progress towards some awesome development. So I, I, I aspire to being a gardener. Every now and again, I lose it. I mean, we're all human and, I, and, I, and I'll, I'll lose my cool every now and again. But when I do, I, want, I check myself and, and then I often reflect back and then I eat myself up inside because I'm going, God, I, fuck, I blew that. But that's what I want. Even the gardener has the big shears, right? You yeah, lop you got to prune it every now and again. 
Yeah, sometimes it's one branch, it. It sometimes to, it's the whole <laughs> so, I, so maybe I'm still being a gardener when I lose it. You're good. But my aspiration is, is to be a gardener. It's, it's, so this brings it, so football, very militaristic. I mean, I coached the NFL for 10 years, and it's, you know, sometimes it's hard not to yell at players, to be perfectly honest. Um, you talked about the flight simulator the other day in like approach to your style of coaching. Um, can you just briefly touch on that? Yeah, and I think we're, I think we're similar philosophically in a lot of ways of, of we, we, we have to yell because there's music on at our practice, so it's really, it's really loud. That's why we have to, I why we have to, yeah. to I yell. Get a, I get a God <laughs> mic. Sometimes I use the God yes. mic, like one of these, and I'm like, you know. <laughs> but uh, I, think, I think telling them what to do, obviously, is one thing that we, we, we always talk about all the time. You know, don't do this, don't do that, don't step up, don't go down, don't, you're, you're too high, don't do that. You haven't told them anything. You've told them what they haven't done and what they shouldn't do, but not you know exactly what to do is something that we talk about all the time. And then, and then yeah, the the, the flight simulator, which again, talking with Andy, we need to get back on the on the Formula One uh, simulator, but of trying to throw those one thousand again, the, the thousand mistakes thing, just as many different variables at, at our guys again in a in a. Uh, not, not of not being accountable. I think that's another thing too. They have to be accountable for what they've done and, or what they want to do or what you want them to do. Um, but again, make that, make that okay to make mistakes and not, not grab the joystick, you know, not grab the wheel of, of have a guy do something, watch it on film, but hey, you know, again, very similar to what Matt was alluding to. And then, and then going, going out the next day and, and making that go away or having them make that go away. And, and then going back, if, if I make a mistake, which is often, uh, acknowledge it, show it on video, have it be very, you know, show them, hey, I screwed this up because we're going to do the exact same thing when the, the right guard does it or the left corner or whoever. And that, again, makes us all kind of, you know, I don't want to say on the same level, but, again, rowing, rowing in the same direction and, and equally accountable for everything. And before we walked in, we talked about play out there. Got a really nice conversation about play. You know, it seems like that looks like a lot of fun. Wish I could do half of it, but can you speak to play as a style uh, of coaching? For, for me, it's sort of imperative. That's when we, I, I work in a very creative environment. We have to create. Uh, earlier today, there was a question about who sees themselves as a creative person. Or the, oh, no, I think the question was, are, are we born creative or are we made creative? And, and my hands shot up immediately that we were born creative. And I was surprised how many arms didn't shoot up. And the reason I think that is I have kids. And anybody who ever was a kid and, or has kids, and I think we were, all were kids, uh, <laughs> kids play. If you want to see creativity in action, watch kids. Kids are creative. We're all creative. The question is, at what point did we lose it? Because that, that's what happened. At one point, we lost it. And I think it's fear. We can become self-conscious. I'm going to be judged if I'm seen as playing. I can't play anymore. Uh, and we, we lose that sense of play. So one of my big goals is to instill it. Uh, right now, it, and all my guys are loving this, but I have mandatory trainings that people have to come to and optional trainings. Right now I'm doing some mandatory trainings where people are coming and it's mandatory playtime, which is really like weird, right? I'm man mandatory playtime. But what I've done is I've taken the environment that we normally perform in and I've altered it. I've brought, we have this act where people uh, walk up the side of a building while bouncing on a trampoline. And I brought the trampoline low, and I put mats around, and I put mats on top of the building. And so it's a different environment where look at all this padding and all the stuff we have. You can do anything you want as long as you don't do anything that's in the show. And keep moving. And then I'll keep sort of give nudging. Hey, I have an idea. Why don't you guys uh, try this? And then I'll step back, and I'll watch them play for a little while. And I know that through this process of play, so we're going to find something. Now, in this new environment, in this new uh, playful environment, he's starting to discover new things. He started moving because I made it safe and I made it fun. And uh, once you do that, then the fear goes away. He, the reason he hasn't done anything new is because he's afraid. He's afraid he's going to get hurt. If I get hurt, then I, I don't, I'm, I'm paid by the show. I'm not paid as much. I, gotta, I got more. It, so he's doing all this calculation. We've, taken, we've, we've brought play back into it. Play is we, essential we to We call us. it jeu, which is just French for play. And we do games. We do... Uh, uh, we, we play silly games. We make him get out of his comfort zone a little bit. We do acting games. Uh, we do starting with just throwing bean bags around a room at each other. And when the bean bag catches you, you got to make a, the same sound. The next person didn't add a, add a sound. Like little simple things he would have done in, in acting class. But we have to do those elements of play because his triple by itself on stage, this rocket of a, of a tumbler, if it doesn't have something else behind it other than just the triple, you might as well go watch a gymnastics concert. 
competition. I have to turn this guy into an artist. And it's all through play. We learn our acrobatics through play. We, uh, we turn ourselves into artists through play. Everything's a game. So football being a slightly different beast, how difficult is it to inject elements of play in, in the way you do? Yeah, we, we definitely try to. Uh, you, can't, yeah, you can't go out and, and do too much full contact. You, know, you can't meet up at a park and play full contact 11 on 11 football, but uh, team building things that they, they kind of don't realize that they're, they're it's very similar to, to what Matt's talking about of whatever it is, the most uh, basic kind of playground game. And then you start talking about, well, hey, I did this when I was in you know, high school, or I did this back growing up, or, oh, where'd you grow up? You know, something, something kind of snowballs out of that. But yeah, somewhere along the, the line, the, the, I don't know the psychology of this, but of the, the kid on the golf courses versus, versus the adult on the golf course. The adult, you know, if after they're done playing golf, it's, well, man, crap, on the 12th hole, I missed that shot, I hit it in the water on 10, I did this. And the kid's like, man, I found a lizard, and you know, I made this, I made this one putt, I don't know who it was, but, you know, and, and that somewhere in there is, is you know, Again, optimal performance uh, uh, psychology, but we're, we're, we're searching for it. That's great. So, so shifting gears uh, for one last question or one last top topic. Why are we? Uh, oh, we're there already, are we? We're almost there. We're getting oh, close. Geez. So, uh, goal setting. All right, goal setting um, is a fundamental thing you know, with coaching. A fundamental process. Um, but both of you are at the pinnacle of a lot of your performers and athletes. You know what they're what they're trying to achieve. You know, for a lot of your athletes, they're trying to get to Cirque. Yeah. And for a lot of your athletes, they're trying to get to Oregon. So how do you recalibrate their goal setting when they actually arrive on campus and they arrive on at Cirque? Matthew, let's kick it off with you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually uh, flip into a, a little story that makes sense of it. Um, sort of about how you never leave where you are until you decide what you want to be, that Mark Twain quote. Uh, I have a, a, a guy that just arrived. Hey, he arrived probably six months ago, so he's not fresh. But he arrived during a bad time at the show. By a bad time, I mean it's a live show, things happen, and we were in a phase where we suddenly needed a whole bunch of people all at once. Uh, we had one guy who retired due to uh, injury. We had another guy who had uh, a meniscus surgery. We had another guy who took another job within the company. So we had all these vacancies all at the same time, all in the same act. So we had to find artists to fill these voids. And we hired this guy. He was a finalist at Worlds. And so I hired him. Unfortunately, our hiring process, we do some crazy things at Cirque, including hiring people purely off video, you know, because we don't have the time or the resources. So I'll hire somebody off video and I'll bring them to the show. And sometimes I'll find out, oh, geez, what I saw in the video was the best thing they ever did. You know, it, it, and, and they can't really reproduce that. So we have similar issues. <laughs> So I watched him in world finals do a relatively simple pass, clean, uh, some weird, a little bit of weird technique here and there, like he whips his head all around uh, when he does certain things. But I sort of thought, okay, it's, you made a golf reference. I don't know if you know who Harvey Penick is. Sure. Uh, Harvey Penick uh, was, speak, it, I, he's got a little book called The Little Red Book and it's full of cool little quotes. But one of them is he, he was speaking to one of his players and uh, the player was like, oh, I got that guy. He's got an ugly grip and an ugly swing. And Harvey Penick said to him, beware of the player who has an ugly grip and an ugly swing because if he's, if he's reached your level, his grooves, he's, he's got his faults grooved and, and you might be in for more, of, and then his player lost three and two the next day, right? So I, I looked at this guy, and I'm seeing him in finals at Worlds, and there's some funky technique there in the way he whips his head around, but he just delivered. So he's got these grooves, he's got his faults grooved, and he's a finalist at Worlds. Okay, bring this guy. I quickly realize, okay, the guy can't jump on trampoline. What I saw him do at Worlds, that's everything he can do, and he nailed it to the best of his ability. Um, he's not at the overall level that I really need in the show. But he's gonna fill in the gap for now, but he's not really a candidate for a permanent contract. Like, he can help for now, but he's not really my guy. But, okay. And I quickly start realizing he has these faults, okay? Because he trained his coach and he had a goal, and his goal, he was just trying to protect. He was trying to do the best he can in his mind. His goal was to make finals at Worlds. Well, I found out this guy's a super talent. He should have been trying to win a medal at Worlds. But he never trained to do a triple. You're not winning Worlds if you don't do a triple. His goal was to just get to Worlds and get clean. 
and, and just get through and maybe other people will crash a little bit and maybe he'll slip into a finals and hit in finals and that was his whole goal. He turns out to be an amazing artist. All right? I said I get these, art, these, these athletes and I have to train them to be, uh, to, be athlete, uh, to be an artist. I don't know how much you can actually teach someone to be an artist. You, you hope that you can pull the artist out from inside of them. And this guy is born to be on stage. He shines, he glows, he moves well with music, his face lights up. He, from the 200 section in the back row, you're looking at this guy and he's popping off stage. But he's missing key skills. So I had to shift goal sets, goal setting with this guy. Your goal is to be in Cirque du Soleil, you want to have a permanent contract. You know all that stuff that you didn't do in sport because you were scared of it? He, he didn't mind doing twisting flips. It's way easier to add a twist than it... I'm talking too much. I'm good. It's, it's way easier to add a twist than it is to add a flip, right? Because your axis is much smaller, and so we never did a triple. To do a triple, you have to basically do two on the way up and one on the way down, because once gravity gets a hold of you, you're, you're coming down fast. And he was scared to death of that, so he didn't do that. He never did trampoline. All he did was tumble. So we have not all the tracks that we do in the show are the same. There's hard tracks and easy tracks, and uh, he could only do the easy tracks. And I rotate the hard tracks. Not everyone's doing the same hard track every week because you die. You can't do the same, the maximum intensity week after week after week. So I can't put him on my permanent lineup. Temporarily he's helping out, but I can't put him on my permanent lineup if I can't rotate him into some of the hard tracks. It's four doubles and it's triple. And he decided that he wants it more than he's afraid of it. So we started on this program to, that's back to the Mark Twain thing about goal setting. Here's where you are, here's where you want to be, and you never knew you never left where you were until you decided where you wanted to be. And now you want to be in Cirque du Soleil, here's what I need you to do. Well, I'm happy to say that the guy is now doing four doubles in training. He is do uh, four doubles in the show. He's been doing that for some time. He's doing triples in training. So he got there and I gave him a permanent contract. He's been with us now for about six weeks on a permanent contract. Smile ear to ear, happiest guy in the world. Uh, so I, speaking about goal setting, I think those are the two things. You never leave where you are until you decide where you want to be, and you have to figure out what the athlete wants, and then you need to have a carrot there that he wants bad enough. And so figuring out what your athletes want. Um, so you have athletes who are coming to Oregon, and that was their dream, and then you have athletes who they have a secondary dream to get to the NFL. Goal setting for those two groups. Yeah, I think, uh, and I know we're up against it, but very, very similar in, in terms of thought process of, of doing two things that are very abnormal, I think, in the traditional uh, drill sergeant or testosterone-filled you know, male football. You ask and you listen and, and, and try to find out exactly what their goals are on the field, off the field, and then you listen and then, and then you show them by, by what you can bring to their, to their world a limitless potential. And then we try to not, we try to not really th talk in terms of numbers or exact, because th they'll go past that. The, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll work beyond that and you know, we always say if, you, if we, you know, your goal is to bench press 300 pounds, okay, now what? You know, it's the same thing, you know, the life with a comma or the life with a period, you know, or the goal as you work, work toward that is just commonly talking about more and better and limitless rather than this number in, in anything. It could be academics and, you know, guys come in with, with a certain uh, mindset of, of, you know, getting through and getting by academically and they could be an academic All-American or a, you know, business owner or a double major and all those things that, 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 you know, again, we want to always talk about that stuff rather than minimums or, or, or benchmarks. And, that, and that's what you mean by living life with a forward lane? Well, yeah, yeah, just of in, in, engaging, you know, of, of, of if, if we're sitting around and I'm breaking things, if I'm sitting there, and, you know, and, and or it, it, just of, of not being engaged with people in what, whatever it is and, and on the front foot or, you know, front on the, whatever those, all those things are. Uh, this time of year, uh, the NFL people come around a lot more, and it's always funny to see our guys that are toward the, the back end of, 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 of our team and they'll never play in the NFL, but now they're always on time. They're always, they've got a new haircut. They're always dressed differently. And they're up, hey, you know, you know Mr. So-and-so from a, a specific team, well, how come we didn't do that five years ago? You know, and, and again, try to use that as a, as a teaching point for everybody else. That's great. So I think we're gonna have to leave it there. Join me and thank you, Chris Mark.